Good afternoon. I'm going to ask everyone to please sit down so we can start the next session. My name is Dot Porter, and I'm the curator for, um, what is my title? <laughs> curator of Digital Research Services at the Schoenberg Institute here at Penn. Um, and I am very pleased to, uh, to introduce our next session. Um, our first speaker is Jeffrey Witt. Uh, Dr. Witt is Associate Professor in Philosophy at Loyola University, Maryland. He's a specialist in high and late medieval philosophy and theology. His present work focuses on the 14th century, but he's also interested in the impact of scholasticism on the Renaissance, the Reformation, and early modern philosophy. His most recent monograph is Robert Holcott in the Great Medieval Thinkers Series, Oxford University Press, 2016. He also has a growing interest in the digital humanities and the process of moving philosophical texts from their original manuscript form to media more accessible to the community of scholars. For the past several years, Dr. Witt has been developing the Scholastic Commentaries and Texts Archive, the Lombard Press Publication Project. And this afternoon, he will be presenting on the reified text resource and the networked medieval scholastic corpus. Dr. Witt, welcome. Great. Thank you very much. It's a real privilege to be here. I love coming to the Schoenberg Symposium. I, most of my life, I can't find anyone to talk with. And uh, <laughs> here, it seems everyone is, is interested. So uh, because I live in fear of uh, the wrath of Lynn Ransom, I am uh, very wary to remain within my time. So I might move slightly faster than I would like to. And I do hope to show some live demos um, and if they fail, we have screenshots, of course. Um, but if I go too fast, you can see that um, you can access these the slide decks yourself. Maybe someone could tweet that. And you can navigate it yourself if you want. So if you get lost or you want to, if you're bored, you can move to your own slide. Um, I'm kind of glad to be um, following such a wonderful set of presentations. Uh, yesterday, I think we saw a lovely set of examples of what I want to call linkable data, right? That begs to be linked in perhaps the technical sense that we spoke of this afternoon. I think this morning we saw several use cases, examples of manuscript catalogs that would benefit from the implementation of linked data. And it's wonderful to be following uh, such a great presentation right before lunch that introduced us to linked data in the technical sense and to the dreaded sparkle. Uh, uh, everything you will see here is, almost everything you will see here is the result of a Sparkle query. So uh, that get longer and longer and longer. All right, since time is short, um, let me begin with a brief remark about the challenges facing the quest to make the medieval scholastic corpus available in ways that I think truly advance the field. And then with these, bro these problems as background, I want to offer some ideas about how thinking about texts in increasingly abstract ways, what I refer to in my title as reifying the text, might allow us to solve some of these challenges. So while I suppose it's true to say that all literature is a series of commentaries upon commentaries, I think this is true in a, in a much deeper sense in the scholastic tradition, perhaps, than anywhere else. The Scholastic tradition, in the scholastic tradition, the commentary was a privileged genre. It is, in a sense, what defines the tradition. Centuries of thinkers engaged in a common discussion across time and space through the act of repeated commentary on canonical texts, whether that be the Bible, Peter Lombard's sentences, Gratian's Decretum, the Corpus of Aristotle, and many, many others. This tradition, then, can be conceived of as a kind of nonlinear space with multiple categories of connections between text passages at many, many levels, so a, hi a hierarchy of text passages. Fully understanding any passage within this space requires situating that passage and its claims within a vast context of connected discussions and within a complicated history of textual transmission. And the problem, as I see it, is that this nonlinear, multidimensional space doesn't fit that well within the linear, two-dimensional form of the printed text. And in many ways, it has made it difficult for us to fully appreciate the contextualized discussion of the scholastic tradition. Um, I think the digital medium offers us some new possibilities. 
by which we might unfold the many multiple networks at play in the scholastic tradition. But I also think this is not guaranteed. Right? So don't uh, come away with the impression that if I just put it on a web page, I've suddenly su succeeded. If we continue to think about commentaries within the paradigm to which the print medium has habituated us, we will succeed in recreating the limits of the printed medium within the new digital medium. So given these challenges, I'd like to offer some brief thoughts on how we might think about our text differently, kind of methodological prologue. And then I want to look at two example networks as case studies. And the networks I want to focus on are um, the text generative history network. I struggle to find the right name for this, but we mean here tracing the manifestations and mutations of a text passage across time and space in uh, a plurality of editions. And second, the text interaction network, namely uh, tracking both the sources and the influences of a text within a larger commentary tradition. So let me first make some methodological remarks. I want to acknowledge that tracing these connections, these networks that I've mentioned and recording them, is I think something that scholarship clearly already seems to value. Observations of the practices of catalogers and textual editors quickly reveal attempts to capture some of this network. So for example, we can just look at a few catalogs that are online. Right? We can see that they're attempting to situate a material object within a text hierarchy, at least by mentioning what text it is. They're also interested in relating it to other discussions. Again, we can see the desire to locate this piece of paper within a text hierarchy, the desire to have the text, the content that appears on this material page. And textual editors are, of course, doing something very, very similar. Every time we make a critical edition, we're making implicit maps. So you can see, uh, perhaps in green, the text hierarchy of sections. Each paragraph is part of that text hierarchy. So we have the paragraphs. And of course, in pink, we have gestures at the material hierarchy. Uh, the, this folio occurs here. This folio occurs here. And in orange, of course, we have an apparatus fontium. The editors are trying to connect us to the sources of this text. And in other editions, you might see scolia where uh, editors are trying to let you alert you to the fact that there are other parallel discussions happening in the commentary tradition. So as noted above, the problem here is that despite the aspiration to reveal these networks and despite the employment of new media, so you know we, we're looking at digital catalogs, so to speak, and even we see this often in digital editions, we are generally still thinking within the context of the printed medium. And thus, we are replacing, replicating practices and habits learned from the printed medium rather than rad radically altering our scholarly practice. So what do I mean? Uh, one way I've tried to capture the kind of shift I, I'd like to affect is by drawing a distinction between the traditional scholarly practice suited to the print medium as a practice of observation and reporting. Right? So here I have in mind this, the, the scholar goes out to a field of manuscripts looks around, the textual scholar goes out to a field, looks around, sees all kinds of things, observes it, comes back home and writes a report. Okay? And I want to contrast that with an alternative method where I think of the creation of self-reporting data. And I uh, use this image of the sense in which uh, prepared data could be sifted into a query, and that query can self-report, deliver us with a report. And if we change the pegs there, we're changing the query, we're changing the question, and the data can answer that question for us. Okay. So among the other problems with uh, persistence in the mode of observation and reporting, I think there are needless redundancy and a lack of transparency. Let me just give you really one quick example. Here we have an excerpt from a traditional online category. It happens to be the pen catalog with the traditional ambition of a cataloger to observe how a manuscript was ruled by counting the lines on a page and then coming back to the catalog entry and reporting what they've seen. Here we have the somewhat ambiguous report that it was ruled in either 33 or 34 lines. It's not wrong, this is true, but uh, it's in a sense a little bit ambiguous and a little bit incomplete. Sometime later, a textual scholar was writing an article on this text. He was here, he observed the manuscript, 
and he counted the lines again. Um, he undertook this tax, task a, a second time and observed the number of lines with a bit more precision, reporting that it's ruled in 33 lines, then 35, and then 34. So we have both redundancy and then we have a discrepancy. And because we lack transparency about how the report was made, in other words, um, because the observations are not um, automatically repeatable, the only way to figure out who has offered the correct report or the, the superior report is ironically to repeat the task a third time. Right? So how can we do this better? Think about this in the mode of creating self-reporting data. Here I've used, we use the computing power to recognize the lines and the line coordinates. And these results then get exported into objects that can have relationships with other objects. And uh, this is RDF, this is the linked data in a technical sense. And here, each line has become a curatable object, a reified line to which uh, property, an infinite amount of properties can be attached and relationships can be inserted. And this is an, appro this is an approach that can scale. Instead of drawing boxes, um, in the last six months, with the help of one student researcher, uh, working to correct the false positives right, of the computer recognition. We've cataloged over 250,000 uh, line coordinates. And as we'll see below, each of these lines becomes the basis of the automatic creation of paragraph and quotation annotations that number in the hundreds of thousands. <clears throat> so instead of reporting the results we're free to ask the codex and the lines themselves over and over again how many lines a page has and where changes occur. So I'll give you one example here. Let's imagine that I'm on a catalog page. This is, you know, try to look past the visualization and think about what data is required to make this happen. You see that I've, um, oh, I've even spelled number wrong. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> you see that uh, no one has typed this, okay? No one has typed this. Uh, it says 66. Uh, it's, it's counting lines, uh, both columns, so just divide it in half, and you can see that it's, uh, it's saying there are 33. Each page is reporting its lines, how many it has. Wait for it. Oh, well, you have a different one. But maybe you don't trust me. Oh, well, just prove it. Okay, so the data tells us how many lines it has. We don't count it, and we can repeat it at any moment. Maybe you want to see the whole codex. We can just say, show me the last line on every page. No problem. We just query the data, right? And we see the changes here. So we move from 33 lines to 35 lines. We move from 35 lines to 34 lines, and so on. Okay, so that's kind of what I have in mind here, methodologically speaking. Is that all, though? Is, are we just talking about getting line counts? No. What else might this enable? Here, let me turn to the first case study here considering the uh, generative history network. How could shifting to the creation of self-reporting data impact our ability to trace this network? What if, like the cataloger who begins to curate manuscript lines as reified objects, the textual scholar took a similar approach and began reifying textual phenomena at granular levels? A tremendous amount of data is created when someone prepares a critical edition, much of which will not fit into a printed book. Thus, scholars will spend years observing textual phenomena and relations, and then they'll report in critical editions a small percentage of what they've seen. For example, scholars may begin by transcribing a given manuscript, and as they proceed, they may often hit enter at manuscript line breaks in order to make it easier to find their place when they return to or begin correcting their transcriptions. And this kind of practice is often viewed as a necessary part of a transitory progress toward a final printed critical edition. Thus, it is a means to an end, and when the printed edition appears, this information is thrown away or buried on a hard drive somewhere. But this seems to me like an incredible waste. Hidden within these markers is an implicit assertion of a complex set of relationships that if we could preserve, could be exploited. Okay. So the simple placement of a line break within a text hierarchy creates a bridge between the material hierarchy and the text content hierarchy that we should be able to exploit. For instance, I now know that paragraph two via lines on which it is manifested includes an appearance or manifestation on page four of a given manuscript. 
But nor is it just the line breaks that are hiding implicit connections. Our transcription paragraph is also hiding or collapsing another hierarchy or set of relationships. And this is where the, the, the idea of reification and abstraction becomes important. If we treat the transcribed text that on a page or in a file as the text, we, we can't go anywhere. We're stuck. This is as far as we can go. But if we see every transcription is actually the transcription of a textual idea that has been manifested or materialized in a particular addition that one is transcribing, then new possibilities emerge. And my poor lonely paragraph, all by itself. But by recording the line breaks, I can map it to a particular page within a particular codex. But by saying that it's a manifestation of a particular textual idea, I can move out to the most abstract form of this particular paragraph. And then I can ask it to tell me all the other places that this idea has manifested itself to the transcriptions, to the line breaks, and to the manuscripts that carry this text. So let's consider what this looks like in practice. Easy comparison of related material codices has always been a highly desirable in manuscript studies. IIIF and IIIF viewers, like Mirador, have prioritized easy comparison as one of their selling points. The problem, from my point of view, as a textual scholar, is that simply bringing manuscripts together into a single viewer, while at first attractive, is a little bit disappointing. What happens when we have hundreds of manuscripts, each with thousands of pages? One must still discover the point of connection, and this is often the most demanding part of any comparison. Thus, to quickly arrive at a granular and therefore useful comparable point, we really need to be addressing a textual idea, and then asking that textual idea to self-report where it can be found within the mass of material codices. So let me provide just a couple of illustrations. Let's imagine for a moment that I'm on Fragmentarium and I discover a fragment of interest. And this fragment um, is only a tiny portion of a much, much larger text. It's a half folio. And by itself, it stands alone, sad, without any friends. It's missing much of the context that makes it meaningful, that makes it interesting. Thus, we might want to compare it to other texts of Peter Lombard that would provide this missing context and thereby make it interesting. And just finding these manuscripts might be difficult, but even if you found them, adding them to a Mirador instance filled with other Lombard texts will still leave you with a lot of work to be done. Figuring out where the fragment exists within the larger generative context of the tradition is very difficult. And once reported, we again lack transparency to understand and confirm the report. And most often, once one person makes the discovery, the next person will have to do it all over again. Okay? So why shouldn't this manuscript and its transcription be prepared in such a way that it, the text can report all the parallel instances of identical text content at once situating it within that network? So let me take the IIIF ID, the manifest, which is as close as we have to a kind of universal identifier for this fragment. And let's put it into a viewer that can understand that. Okay, so immediately the text reports what part of the Lombard text it refers to. On the right, it shows us text objects that appear on this fragment, you know, paragraphs. Okay? And I can say, show me all the related paragraphs. And now I get a list of other manuscripts that also contain this identical text content. So from this, I can move over to the Parker Library. It can report on the left, again, where it's situated. I can see this in the Hopkins manuscript. I can see this in the Ecodices manuscript, like so. I'll come back to the Leipzig. And again, maybe you don't trust me. Prove it. I know this is a Sparkle query. I'm sorry. But the Sparkle query is a proof of the relationship. Why are these related? In the Sparkle query, when we decode it, it's a, a logical proof that says why these things are related. Further, because we know the line breaks on which each of these text objects occur, we can focus in on the specific paragraph of this text object and again see it in different places. Like so. Okay. And because we know where that this is a part of a text, we can actually move out to the text object and view it like so, beginning to explore the text that appears in this fragment as we move along line by line. Asking more about it, the paragraph can generate its own citation. So as you see, it generates where it is and what folio it appears on. And if I move to the Hopkins manuscript, for example, I move to that identical paragraph, and it reports the folio it's on. 
like so. We can use this to provide transparency, for example, in a critical edition. So we have a sigla, we say, prove it. We can see the, the exact line in which the variation occurs. We can pull up the text represented in each parallel manuscript and get a comparison. And we can explore the images side by side as we move through the manuscript. So I'll just move paragraph to paragraph and we see getting images from Cambridge and getting images from Baltimore as we move. Let me conclude then by moving to one last network, tracing the interaction, text interaction network. Again, the desire to map the relationships between scholastic texts is really as old as the tradition itself, the Bonaventure edition from the late 19th century is filled with scolian of saying, here's, here's related discussions, here's related discussions, go find them. The, uh, but the traditional practice is one of editors making observations and then reporting anecdotally the results of those ob observations, and these have severe limitations, the most dramatic of what, which is what I call unidirectional references. A unidirectional reference is a reference that can point in one direction but cannot be automatically reciprocated. This means if editor A discovers that author X cites Y, and editor B knows that author Z cites author Y, editor A will never be able to learn about author Z, despite the fact there's already enough information to conclude this. And this, I think, is the real tragedy, is that we miss the, the inferential possibilities of our collective knowledge. So the creation of self-reporting or reified references, uh, 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 a reference that becomes a kind of object that can point or link to reified text ideas changes this. It allows every reference to become a kind of bi-directional reference. The power of this can be seen in the following. Here we have a traditional apparatus fonti, and the editor has said, look, this is a quotation from canon law. And with much labor, one can look up the Liber Extra and find the citation. And there they may learn from the, the observation of that editor that this is actually a quotation from Peter Lombard. But this is the end. You cannot go any farther. Lombard does not update. Lombard is the originating source. And you miss the contextual context, that all of these authors are citing in different ways the same discussion. And each of these colors, if you begin at one of them, will dead end on another. But when we can make bi-directional references, each one becomes reversible, and we can traverse the network in any direction without end. And viewers can begin then to exploit this. So you could be reading the Lombard edition. Here I'm on paragraph 12. And Lombard makes no quotation to the future. How could it? Right? Uh, but everybody who's made a link to this paragraph gets inverted and can report. You see all these passive references, referenced by, referenced by, quoted by. Right? And one can follow any of these links forward in the future and discover both the passive and the active references traversing you know, 300, 400 years of commentary tradition giving us something like this represented as a kind of discovery mechanism. So finally, what happens when we combine these two networks, the generative history network and the text interaction network? Get something like this, our original graphic here. We can start at any transcription, move to a codices, and then out to an expression. But each textual idea can reference other textual ideas, and from there, I can map out to their manifestations, their transcriptions, and the codices and the pages on which they fall. Okay. And we can illustrate some of that in one final app here. Let's begin. This is a, another visualization of the same data. Right? These are all elaborate Sparkle queries, and I'm simply going to ask for a quotation that can, uses this word clypus, which I know is in a quotation from Lombard. And here I've discovered two quotations that use this word. And now I'm going to inspect the instance of this quotation. Right? And in clicking on any of the quotations that appear in each of the manuscripts, you see that I'm getting the images of those manuscripts. And of course, I can also have the source context paragraph. So this is the paragraph that they're quoting from. And this is in Lombard. And so I can say, show me this in the Parker Library. I can make that big, right? so on. OK, so let's say I, uh, through this discovery, I got really interested in the uh, Lombard text. I might want to say, show me any other text that quotes this paragraph unit. I can just reverse. We're exploiting the bi-directionality of this quotation. And now I'm going to get all quotations and references 
that I make reference to this paragraph. So now I have references and quotations that occur here. And finally, because every paragraph is situated in a, in a, in a hierarchy of paragraphs, of sections, of chapters, of books, I can move up that hierarchy and explore the kinds of relationships that I want to see every quotation of Lombard's prologue. I want to see the frequency of these quotations across works. But that's too narrow. I'd like to see the all quotations of book one. And that's too narrow. I want to see all quotations of the sentences by Peter Lombard. OK, and then I could filter this by author. I could filter this by work group. Let's say I only want to see quotations of Lombard in canon law and something else. Let's p pick a particular author, Peter Gracilis, and then his sentence here. And I only want to see his quotations of Lombard in book one. I want to see the frequency of these across his corpus, like so. Okay. And then when I want to explore those quotations, right, I should be able to search them. Well, I'm too low now, but you get the idea. Let me uh, conclude then. Lynn, you're going to get mad if I take two more minutes? No. <clears throat> Let me close with a brief statement, if only to be provocative. While there are many new modes of analysis that digital humanities uh, opens up, I've intentionally focused my attention here on use cases that I think scholarship has already deemed worthwhile, such as the aspiration for text textual transparency or the creation of indices, source discovery, and other tools for discovery. Moreover, everything I've described here is compatible with traditional publication of a critical text. And therefore, in my mind, the old arguments that I can't do things this way because I need peer review or I need a printed book are just no longer valid. My text has been peer reviewed by the Medieval Academy of America. The same text that made all those quotations possible, I made into a book. Right? And I love this. I found this this morning. This is a, a comment on Will's lecture from a while back. Joe is not very happy, and Joe says, I just want a PDF no faffing about. Now, I don't know what it means to faff, but I think Joe is the one who's faffing because he doesn't get it that a PDF is just a presentation data. And so the question is not, can we have a PDF? The question is, how do we get to a PDF? Right? Um, so in conclusion, since scholarship clearly recognizes these activities as worthwhile and already aspires to these results. And second, since we've always also seen that the printed medium imposes limits on these aspirations. And third, since the adoption of a new workflow and data creation paradigm can overcome these limitations, there appears to me no longer any good scientific reasons for institutions, academic societies, and scholars not to be demanding an instantaneous change. The submission of closed print only uh, sorry, um, uh, a change to the creation of open, machine-accessible, and self-reporting data. The submission of closed print-only text editions to for-profit publishers, to my mind, no longer seems scientifically justifiable. Yeah, thank you. Our next speaker is Athanasios Velios. Dr. Velios is reader in documentation in Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon and Legatus. He completed his PhD in the Royal College of Art, Victoria and Albert Museum Conservation Program run in association with the Imperial College. Dr. Velios' current works currently works with linked data technologies, ontologies, and knowledge organization systems to model records from memory institutions. He is a member of the CDOC CRM special interest group contributing and extending the standard, and he co-chairs the linked art ICOM CDOC group. This afternoon, he will be presenting on modeling bookbinding descriptions with the CDOC CRM and the language of bindings thesaurus. Welcome. And I think I've got a keyboard here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's great to be here, and I am enjoying the conference immensely. Uh, fantastic presentation just, just now, but also from uh, earlier today and, and yesterday. Um, I think um, 
I'm considering linked data with capital L and, and D uh, as these things, yeah. So it is, it is about integration, it is about ontologies, uh, it's about identifiers and, and reconciliation, the things that people mentioned earlier. Uh, but as the um, couple of the presentations uh, were going on yesterday, I thought a couple of the examples were particularly interesting. I really enjoyed uh, the, um, the one with um, the commentary of the Arabic manuscript jumping from one subject to another. Uh, and I thought, well, this is exactly what linked data is. The uh, additional value is not so much the connections that we engineer in the data set, but it's the connections that we do not expect. Yeah? So it's the serendipitous nature of that um, data set. Anyway, the, um, uh, the story starts here. Uh, that's the uh, St. Catherine's Monastery in, um, in Sinai. Um, and I, um, I joined a team of conservators uh, visiting the monastery over a period of about 10 years, uh, looking at uh, bindings. The monastery has a wonderful collection of manuscripts in early or original bindings, so it's a good place to study book binding history. Um, you may recognize some of these people over there. Um, uh, the one standing is um, Professor Nicholas Pickwood, who led the project. The one sitting down is George Budalis. They both have uh, a profound understanding of binding history, and I, I have been privileged really to, um, to work with them over the years uh, alongside the rest of the uh, uh, team members. Um, and the, the, the books in the, um, in the monastery are uh, wonderful. They're really nice objects. The tendency is to spend more and more time looking at them and describing them. Uh, we had about an hour for each book. Um, and this is the kind of form that we were using to produce our bookbinding descriptions. We started off with paper many years ago, then we moved on to a, an XML uh, form and, um, and database. Um, but the, when we were working at the monastery, building these forms up, uh, we realized very quickly that one of the problems we had was terminology. Uh, we did enough to make the project happen in terms of the uh, vocabularies that we were um, using and the terminology we were using for the project, but we, we knew from the beginning that we needed to work on terminology further. Uh, that led to the Language of Bindings Thesaurus project. Um, people confuse Ligatus with the Language of Bindings Thesaurus. Ligatus is the research center that made this project happen. The Language of Bindings Thesaurus is a collaborative project with many partners. We organized workshops. A lot of people have contributed you know, much of their time to make this happen. So there are two different things. Um, uh, and it, it continues. It's always been a very popular uh, resource on our, um, on our website. It, can, it comes stops in the um, entry pages and also the referral pages. The search page for, for the thesaurus is, is there at the top. Um, so we consider it as a project that uh, has had a real impact in the, um, uh, in the domain and we are um, uh, trying to develop it and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, uh, more about our plans later. Um, but I, I wanted to start with this idea of linked data and what it is that we do when we produce linked data. Uh, and what we do is we perform a mapping exercise. So I've got, I've got my database. Um, and the uh, main record of my database is the binding, the book here. So I've got the book, and the idea is that I need to match that with an abstract entity from another data structure that is more generic, uh, so that when I do that and everybody else does that, then we can all search based on that abstract um, uh, data structure, very much what the MMM project did. Yeah. So. <clears throat> This is, uh, this is about my book, the record of my book. This is the CDOC CRM uh, class hierarchy that provides these abstract entities that I need to map to. Let's see, I've got, I've got my book. Uh, I hope you can see that. It's, um, and I need to choose now. I've got a book, what, what class does it match in the CDOC CRM, yeah? Is it a temporal entity? Uh, therefore, something that requires time to be observed, like a music performance or a football game, yeah? Or is it something relatively stable, like a persistent item? And of course, the book 
yeah, it changes. As conservatives, we know it changes all the time. But actually, if I come back tomorrow, it's going to be pretty much the same. So, so we decide that it is a persistent item at that level, yeah? And then uh, we want to check, is it a thing or is it an, an actor? The actor is an entity that has the mental capacity to uh, make decisions and be responsible for these decisions, yeah? Uh, the book, we think, doesn't have that mental capacity. So it is probably a thing. Okay, now, is it a legal object or is it a man-made thing? And uh, somebody could say, well, it's, it's, it's both of these things. Of course, of course it is, yeah? If we spoke to a lawyer, they would almost certainly say it's a legal object, but I'm not a lawyer. I'm not interested in that aspect of the book. I'm only interested in the fact that it's produced by somebody. Therefore, I choose to consider it as a man-made thing over there. Now, a man-made thing, is it a physical thing, an entity with three dimensions in the space as we understand it, or is it something that lives in my head, a conceptual object? And it's, of course, a, a physical thing. So you get the, the, the process. So you work your way through the classes, and you, you, you try to make it as specific as possible. If you're not sure, well, stay where you are. Yeah, as it, It's better to have a, a, a positive... Um, uh, a general description than a, a false a detailed description. Okay, so it's a, it's a physical man-made thing, it's a man-made object. Uh, for these things, uh, I need to really read the definitions behind the, the, the scope notes. So uh, for man-made object, we have something that says, um, this class comprises physical objects purposely created by human activity. Therefore, not rocks that fell down the mountain, yeah? Something that a, a human made, okay. Uh, we got to perform that exercise for every single field in our, uh, in our database. So it sounds like a lot of work, but we only do it once, and I only have to do it for my database. Other people do it for their own databases. It's actually a pretty sustainable way of, of producing linked data, yeah, and, and integrating resources. Um, now, this is the second step of the exercise. Um, this is, this is uh, one of the pages uh, from the form we were using to describe the manuscripts. There is a box there that says lining, the red box, and that is geometrically, as it were, spatially situated inside spine. There are lots of linings on a book, yeah? We can have board linings or other things. Uh, the fact and only that this box is inside the spine box makes my brain think this is a spine lining, not anything else. Uh, so this is almost like the context that comes with my training and my experience. It's automatic. I don't even have to think about it. But that kind of context, no piece of software can have. So we need to make it explicit, yeah? So this implied relationship that is built into my database there has to be made into an explicit statement that then a piece of software can use. And the statement is part of, yeah? The lining is part of the spine. I've got a few more examples here. Uh, the, the glue uh, uh, is of type animal. Huh? Um, I've got Greek. Uh, it's not Greek salad, yeah? It's Greek technique for producing an end band. All this context, again, lives in my head. Um, material for the secondary end band, and so on. So you get, you get the point how, how that process works. Now, um, uh, the work that the CEDOC CRM uh, special interest group has done over the past 20 years is to examine all these types of relationships and formalize, formalize them. It turns out there are not so many. It turns out that all these relationships that different databases have implied are similar. Uh, so what I've done here, and the, and the, and the, the, the CRM SIG did exactly that. It, it sort of formalized these types of relationships. So I've expressed exactly the same statements at the top with the formalized versions of the uh, relationships at the bottom from the, from the CRM. We call that the predicates, yeah, the properties that mentioned um, earlier today. Okay, so the man-made object, we, 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 um, we, we saw the definition for this. Uh, this is the a child class of the physical man-made thing, which is slightly different, slightly more generic. Now, the physical man-made thing has got to 
properties there. It can depict things eh? and it can show visual items. Uh, and because uh, every man-made object is a physical man-made thing, these properties also apply to the man-made object. They're inherited. Uh, and the same applies for the grandfather. Eh? Uh, and I can work all my way up to the hierarchy, up to the top. So all of these properties, once I have established that my thing, the thing I'm talking about, is a man-made object, I then have a, a long list of implied relationships that I can express through these properties. Um, and like um, Amiko said earlier, it's, it's the, the model is uh, uh, centered to the activity, yeah? around the activities and the events is where we, we uh, hook actors, we hook things, we hook uh, periods and places, um, and so on. Right, one of the classes now in the CDOC CRM hierarchy is a special one. It's the E55 type. Uh, and you will notice that very high up in the hierarchy, so everything in the CRM can have a type, yeah? Um, can have a type. So this is very much the kind of um, uh, classification that people do in museum catalogs, library catalogs, and so on. We classify things. This is something that we do all the time. Anything can have uh, a type in the, in the CRM. Um, so the class E55 type is down there, if I zoom in. Uh, now, uh, and this is the point where the expertise of the special interest group for the CDOC CRM stops. This is the point where the expertise of specific domains starts, yeah? Uh, now the CDOC CRM people uh, have no idea about uh, the fish thesauri and, uh, you know, building archaeological uh, databases of things, yeah? Uh, they wouldn't go into that depth because they have no expertise. They harvest that expertise for the individual groups that understand the variety of the, um, of the types and the things that we observe in, in these domains. Um, so, uh, if you are describing books and book bindings, then you can use the language of binding thesaurus. Um, the, the domain expertise comes from that. So, the CRM is a very generic ontology, deals with very broad uh, uh, concepts, um, and the thesauri provide the domain expertise of an area, yeah? And we can link the two through the E55 type class. And this is the reason why the top terms of the language of binding thesaurus look so strange to some people, yeah? Because they match the classes of the CRM for which they provide types, okay? We've got objects, features, I'll say a, little, a few things about that. Uh, actors, places, symbolic objects are last, typically the text, yeah? Which we don't really uh, care about. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, so uh, so I'm going to give now a few examples of uh, statements that um, uh, we can uh, make uh, uh, using the thesaurus and the uh, CDOC CRM. So this is uh, about a person, the bookbinder of the specific manuscript, Greek 418, um, which has a type, and the type is uh, a, a bookbinders, yeah? Uh, so you could say that, and then you will see that this comes from the thesaurus, the E55 type. Uh, now, some people don't like this because the same bookbinder is also a gardener, a cook, and I don't know what else. Uh, and if we have all these different classifications for that person, we don't really know in what capacity he has performed this bookbinding action. Um, so another way of doing it is to say, okay, we've got the activity of binding uh, of the specific book, we have the actor who performed that activity, and then we specify the role of the actor in, in, that, in that case, yeah, as a bookbinder. Uh, other things we could say is that a physical uh, object uh, bears man-made uh, features, yeah, the E19 and E25. Uh, object is something that has uh, three dimension and occupies its own space. Uh, the feature is something that has three dimensions, but does not occupy its own space. It has to live on somebody else's space, on an object space, yeah? So, uh, for example, the, um, 
the, the, the button, there's a big button outside the, uh, the library. The button is an object. The buttonhole is a feature, yeah? You cannot have a buttonhole without the shirt around it. Um, so the decoration on a cover of a binding is typically a feature, yeah? Uh, it's, not, it's not a thing on its, on its own. And you will notice that uh, that ends up again as type. The type for decoration is blind tooled over there. Uh, things can be composed of other things, so we can break down the complex object of the book into individual components of the binding. Um, and again, uh, each one of them can have a type. So the cover of the specific book has type covers, uh, um, and so on. And you will notice that all of these statements end up at type, 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 which is the point of uh, linking between the CRM and the thesaurus. I can say more things, uh, where things are situated on the book, head, tail, and so on, um, whether something carries a symbolic object like, like the text, uh, and, um, and whether uh, there is a, a, a technique used to, pr to produce um, the binding, uh, and what the material of the thing is. So the material is a kind of type here. Um, so uh, I, there, there are more, more uh, statements or types of statements that can be made, and uh, we are sort of uh, continuously working on this, but um, these are sort of some that are very, very popular. Okay, so now the, the hierarchies in the language of bind binding thesaurus look a bit like this. So I've got objects and then things that are objects underneath. Uh, we have paid particular attention not to break things here, yeah? So everything that goes under the object hierarchy is an object. So if you choose any of the terms under the object hierarchy, as a type for E22 man-made object, it will not be a mistake. We have spent a lot of time making sure that all this is consistent. But people complain because uh, I'll bring another example. Yeah, uh, we have end bands, and a headband is an end band. A compound end band is an end band. A stack-on end band is an end band. Okay, but people want to see this. They want to see the primary core, which is not an end band the secondary core, which is not an end band, under that hierarchy. Uh, because the, 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 the brain works like that. Yeah, I'm looking for a term that sort of goes with end bands, so I'm going to go to the end bands and find it. But that's not the case over here. And on the left-hand side, we have this strict hierarchy that we have to follow in order for the thesaurus to work with the CRM. On the right-hand side, we've got what we call a partitive relationship, yeah? that the thing that is underneath is part of the thing above. And there's a standard. Nobody has mentioned SCOS so far, so I'm very happy to introduce a new acronym. Um, the SCOS is the Simple Knowledge Organization System, and it provides the kind of relationship, the properties that are required to um, uh, link these terms with, it, with each other. So we have uh, what they call the broader generic here and the narrower generic. Uh, which is the left-hand side of my hierarchy, and they have the broader partitive and the narrower partitive, which was the right-hand side. So there are ways of encoding these as uh, linked data again. Yeah? So SCOS is a, is a way to publish thesauri as linked data. Another important uh, point about the um, uh, uh, linked data and thesauri is this idea of the URI, yeah, the unique identi global identifier that uh, we need to provide for every single thing that we're talking about. Uh, and you will see here that I'm at the page uh, legatus.org.uk slash lob concepts and, 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 and the number, uh, but I'm saying in that page that actually the concept URI is something different, is the w3id.org. Um, again, we, we paid a little bit of attention in, in this case because um, we thought, what happens if after 20, 50 years, uh, we are no longer able to afford legatus.org.uk and, and the, the, the thesaurus needs to be moved to another domain? All the records that people will have made in their databases based on that URL, URI, will be broken. Uh, they will point to nothing. So uh, instead of doing that, 
uh, we used a service called W3ID, uh, which I highly recommend, uh, that allows you to produce URIs that will be persistent in the future. How they do that? It's very easy. You go to GitHub, to that repository, you clone that repository, and all you need to do is create a rule, a redirection rule, from the w3id.org domain to your own domain. So if in the future there's another domain for the language of binding thesaurus, all I need to do is go here, change one line in that configuration file, and it, it, it all works as it should. So uh, the current rule, and for those who are interested, these are um, Apache uh, configuration files. Um, so they're running an Apache server and just doing redirections all the time. Um, so uh, I, I, over here, it replaces the w3id.org with legatos.org.uk. So it's a very um, easy and efficient way of, um, of solving that, that problem. Another discussion that we've been having is this issue of versioning. Uh, so you have a thesaurus and then you make some changes and you uh, do a new release, yeah, a new version of the thesaurus comes out. Um, and people argue on whether we should have these uh, uh, versions embedded in the URIs or not. Of course, people who write software like having these things embedded because then they can quickly uh, figure out where they are. Uh, the argument is that we should not have version indication of versions in the URIs of the terms and the concepts. If the URI of a concept changes, it means that there has been significant change in the concept as well. If there has been a significant change in the concept, please create a new concept. Otherwise, leave it as it is, yeah? Um, so it, it, then it creates a, a, a hell when it comes to matching different versions uh, from, the, from the database. And there's absolutely no reason to include a uh, version in the concept URI. You could, of course, include a version if you want in the, in the um, uh, data set uh, URI, which is a slightly different thing. Okay, right, so I'm, I'm uh, 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 going to say a couple of things now about the uh, future development and I'm gonna uh, uh, finish this presentation. Um, uh, please look up this, this project. This is one of um, uh, our more recent projects, the Link Conservation Data. As part of this project, what we did was we um, gather together uh, vocabularies and thesauri that people use uh, when producing records in conservation. The problem, there are lots of them for book and paper, yeah? The problem is, of course, that if I'm using one thesaurus and another database is using a different thesaurus, link data is not going to work. Uh, it's similar to the reconciliation problem that was mentioned earlier. Um, only this is a little bit more uh, easy because uh, you're actually dealing with authority files that need to be, to be matched. So the idea is that you have uh, a, a concept in one thesaurus, a term in one thesaurus, and you want to match it to a term in another thesaurus. Once the match is established, then okay, I can work out a Sparkle query to, um, to go from one to, to another. Um, and we are publishing um, uh, workflows to help people uh, undertake this, um, this alignment. Uh, we call it the vocabulary alignment task. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail uh, of all this. Uh, the juicy bit is down there, yeah? Uh, and again, SCOS is um, uh, coming to a rescue over here because it provides uh, some properties that allow to link uh, concepts from one thesaurus to another. Uh, one of them is called uh, close match. Another one is called exact match. And the definition for the two is useful, but I don't know how useful. It says, uh, uh, indicates that two concepts are sufficiently similar that they can be used interchangeably in some information retrieval applications. The other one, uh, across a wide range of information retrieval applications. Okay, I think it's to do with the confidence of the human who sits and checks the two terms and figures out if, if they are the same, similar to... Uh, reconciliation uh, issues. Um, uh, the second bullet point might be a little bit controversial. Um, I'm, I'm told that uh, it's, a, it's a rather bad practice to use um, this, uh, this property here, which basically means the same as, yeah? It means that what I've got here is what is over here. And it isn't, it never is, yeah? They're always different. Uh, some people use it, it's a very useful shortcut. I've done it in the past many times. I'm trying to avoid it now. <laughs> Um, 
And we've got these properties, uh, broad match and narrow match. So what, what this allows you to do is to say a concept from one thesaurus is narrower to a concept from another thesaurus. Very useful thing. It takes a lot of time to start building all these properties. So I think for the time being, we will ignore the, the bit in the bottom. So the next steps for the thesaurus is really to try and align it to other thesauri. We've done some work with AAT, but obviously LBMS and uh, RBMS and many, many other things need to be, to be done. So that's one task. Um, it's, it's to build the, um, the part of hierarchy so that people can use their intuition to find, to find terms that are now seem in, in the wrong place. Um, many people in the past have uh, asked for pictorial descriptions in the thesaurus because some of the uh, textual descriptions uh, are, are rather dense and it's difficult sort of to understand exactly what, what the concept is about. Um, and, uh, and, and we also need to um, uh, improve and expand our um, translations. Um, this is a lot of work. Um, we haven't got a huge team working on it. Uh, this is the editorial uh, board of the Thesaurus and they're sp spending a lot of the free time contributing to the Thesaurus. Uh, but, but really, these are, these are big projects. Um, so I'd like to finish with uh, uh, saying that um, if, you have, uh, if, if you don't have money, don't worry, um, uh, you can still make huge contributions to the Thesaurus by finding our mistakes and uh, suggesting new terms and, um, and concepts, or if you're working with different languages, so much the better. If you have money, we've got lots of things to pay for, but I'll, I'll leave that now. Um, okay, thank you very much to the editorial board, and thank you very much for your attention.